What's with the lead pipe? Are you gonna get my noggin a flogging? <laughs> Allow me to start this video off with an anecdote. One 4th of July weekend, a young slip maker had his friends over so we could all take turns marathoning the first horror game I'd ever owned, Resident Evil 4. We eventually passed out and had to finish the last chapter the following morning, but it was one of the most fun and memorable nights of my childhood. The following 4th of July, we thought we'd follow it up with a new horror title I'd been hearing about, Condemned Criminal Origins. As the eerie menu music faded in and every one of us was startled by good old Agent What's-His-Name rapping on the squad car's window, my parents left us in the care of Monolith Productions for the evening as they took off for a fancy dinner. Two hours later, they returned to find us all taking turns playing Mario Sunshine instead, because about an hour in, Condemned had left us too terrified to proceed. We thought we were men, but Condemned revealed us to be merely boys. The question is, now that I've grown up, does Condemned still have the power to get under my skin and really scare me? Okay, yeah, it does. Condemned Criminal Origins is a first-person horror game with a very gritty, down-to-earth premise and a focus on melee combat over gunplay. It's a bit of a sleeper hit. It was an Xbox 360 launch title, the only horror-themed one I know of, so a lot of people picked it up with the console. It opened to mixed reviews, but over the past few years, a lot of big names in the gaming scene have been looking back and recognizing it as one of the strongest 7th-gen horror games. Its sequel, Condemned 2 Bloodshot, is equally infamous, but for a very different reason that we'll get into. Our hero is Ethan Thomas, an agent of the Serial Crimes Unit, or SCU, which is an agency with a thousand times more legitimacy than the first encounter assault recon because their acronym doesn't make them sound like a joke. You gotta be fucking kidding me. This is why nobody takes us seriously. Although to be fair, both fared better than the advanced neuro-linked urban strike team. During what I can only assume is a routine investigation for Ethan where he stops to collect dead birds, our protagonist has his pistol stolen off of him by an unknown serial killer who turns the gun on Ethan's partners then tosses him out a window. How does it feel to be on this end of the gun? Feels great. Ethan wakes up in his apartment later that night. I think the implication is that either serial killer X or creepy family friend Malcolm Van Horn dragged an unconscious Ethan there, but I like to imagine instead that Ethan is an extremely incompetent detective who fell five stories, then went home to take a nap without informing the Bureau that all his partners were murdered. Regardless of how you choose to imagine he got there, Ethan is now a wanted man, so he decides the best course of action is to pursue serial killer X through the abandoned part of the city to clear his name. On his way, Ethan is appalled at the homelessness crisis that the politicians have let develop in his own town, and decides to finally be the Good Samaritan and do something about it. Every area in the game is crawling with hobos, drug addicts, insane people. The ambiguity of what's up with them is a fun, creepy plot point, but whatever they are, they like three things. Living in squalor, murdering you, and murdering each other. Letting the game's enemies turn on each other is a brilliant AI trick to kill two birds with one stone. It helps avoid the prevalent issue in melee first-person games, where combat is better done one-on-one -on -one than fighting in groups, and it adds to the sense that these are kill-crazy lunatics and aren't just video game obstacles targeting you. The character animations age like fine wine, although maybe it's because I'm a connoisseur of amusing ragdolls. On top of feeling weighty, desperate, and just totally brutal, the melee fights also feel really unpredictable, which is exactly what you want in a horror game. By the end of the campaign, you'll still never be 100% sure whether an enemy is fainting and attacks make you slip up, about to absolutely wail on you, or just pretending to recoil in pain while they wind up a wild retaliatory swing. And yeah, I'm sure you already know this, but Condemned is all about melee combat. Ethan didn't leave home expecting to be a video game protagonist today, so he brought one clip of ammo instead of the usual seven. When you do get your hands on a the gun, they're quite effective, but there's no reloading, just an animation to see how many rounds you have left. Use what's in it, then beat people with it till it breaks. On the whole, the game's mechanics are very stripped down. There's no inventory, health packs have to be used on the spot like Bioshock candy bars, and the run button I assume was implemented as a joke. Your four moves are hit people with the blunt object in your hand, block attacks with the blunt object in your hand, kick your height like Carl Pilkington, or tase bros. The rechargeable taser is the stuff of legends, especially when it gets upgraded. There's a late game event where Ethan loses a finger and has his taser taken from him, and if I were Ethan, I'd probably be more upset about the taser than the finger. Keeping the mechanics simple and not feeling video gamey, so to speak, does a good job of keeping the player immersed. But the game does lose a bit of momentum toward the end because there's just not all that many mechanics to work with. There's fast weak enemies, big strong damage sponges, and the always welcome stealth murderer posing as a mannequin. And then there's the occasional nutter with a gun. Most of the times they kill you, you'll probably shout bullshit, because unless you know where they're going to pop out from, they can absolutely melt your health bar instead seconds. Oh, come on. One final note in the combat, the last chapter of the game is really, really bad. It'll only take you 20 minutes to clear at tops, but it leaves a bad taste in your mouth. They introduce two types of enemies, one has a ton of health but no reach, so it's just hit, 
backpedal, hit, backpedal until they go down. And one has super floaty ninja animations that are hard to tell when you're meant to be dodging. This is all outside of any horror atmosphere too. You just walk down a rural road, fighting enemy after enemy out in the open, which feels totally against the spirit of the game. Then you cap it off with the final boss that you have to beat in a QTE, but the QTE prompt doesn't show up until he finishes his falling to his knees animation, so if you're like me, you'll think you've stunlocked him and just keep wailing and wailing on him for minutes, waiting for him to die. <laughs> I know it's hard to stomach for the completionists out there, but if you have the willpower to do so, uh, just shut the game off after chapter 9 for your own good. Rounding out the game mechanics is an evidence collection minigame. At certain, very spelled out points, Ethan whips out a blacklight, gas sensor, or camera to investigate some criminal wrongdoings. The gas sensor and blacklight guide you toward objectives, but there is really only one section toward the end of the game where they're used creatively to put you in danger of being attacked since your weapon isn't at the ready, and the camera is just one massive long game ploy by the developers to scare the absolute shit out of you at one point near the end of the game, which, for what it's worth, bravo, because it fucking worked. Image seems to match personnel file. It didn't come through properly, though. Can you take a close-up? The detective element really just seems like it's showing off some 7th gen tech and tying loose plot ends together. There's not a lot to it in the first game, let's just move on to the plot. Turns out that Serial Killer X is a sort of serial killer killer. Think Dexter Morgan or Tom Waits and his wife in Seven Psychopaths. We go around the country killing people who go around the country killing people. Like serial killer killing. So Ethan tries to track Serial Killer X by tracking his soon-to-be victims, woman strangler and mannequin enthusiast The Matchmaker, and Jigsaw Without the Pretension The Torturer. It's a fairly simple plot, really more of a framework to hang the levels on, but I've generally found that unless the writers know exactly what they're doing, most video games are better off having a simple and clean plot. I know ever since Bioshock, everybody wants to have the next big twist, so this will rarely happen, but still, I can dream, right? My main nitpick of the plot is that it may be a little too stripped down. This is a horror game after all, so a lack of cutscenes and radio silence helps build a sense of immersion in the desperate loneliness of Ethan's mission, but it does lose momentum somewhat in the early game when there are three chapters back-to-back -back set in a subway office, subway station, and then subway tunnel. With only 10 chapters in the game, and one of those just being an interlude, that means that roughly a third of the campaign is set in a subway. Fortunately, the combat is still fresh at that point, and the Christmas Mall and elementary school levels that immediately follow it are a shot of pure terror adrenaline. One gripe about the characters I have, also we're getting into spoilers, Ethan is ultimately unsuccessful in his bid to beat SKX to the punch. Both the torturer and the matchmaker get 86 before Ethan is able to have a confrontation with them. In fact, we never hear either of these serial killer characters even speak. It's a shame since the game is so obviously influenced by Seven and Silence of the Lambs, two films with very memorable villains. There's no boss fights, no evil rants, no creepy scene where you see them taunting another victim as you sneak in to confront them. The serial killers are basically MacGuffins. This guy's the matchmaker. Well, he certainly didn't kill himself and set it up this way. The end of the story is a bit shaky. There's some sort of semi-supernatural evil influence compelling both the crazed people of the city and SKX to act as they do. Ethan confronts it in a nightmare world at the top of a barn, then Gutshot fades to Black's SKX in the trunk. It's actually a moral choice thing, but if you don't have the stones to do it, good old SKX does the job for you. So, that about does us on Condemned 1, a damn fun horror game that held up even better than I remembered. It doesn't overstay its welcome, or well, even when it does, it's only about by 20 minutes or so instead of several hours. You can clear the main campaign in roughly 5 hours, but it's 5 hours you're not going to forget about anytime soon. It's basically a 5 hour panic attack. And just imagine how awesome games like Skyrim would be if the melee combat felt this good. The ending, with the revelation of a secret supernatural evil force influencing everything that you promptly beat the shit out of, Reminds me of Kingdom Hearts 1 of all things, which is appropriate because the plot of Condemned 2 reminds me of Kingdom Hearts 2 in its own terrible way. Oh yeah, let's get to Condemned 2. A warning to the old, the young, and the weak at heart. It only gets more fantastical, more, dare I say, fucked up from here. Condemned 2, in concept, seems like a good idea. It's a bit like going back to college, a second chance to pipe some crazy people. It plays very similar to Condemned 1. Melee combat has these little combos added that introduce some variety at the expense of making things feel a bit more video gamey and therefore less scary. You'll quickly pick up on how much easier it is to block and backpedal out of range this time as you execute the combos. The somewhat lackluster takedowns from the first game have been replaced with much more amusing environmental kills. There's not really a way to use these things tactically, they're just a Manhunt-esque reward for winning a fight.
The game also has gunplay sequences that are much more like a traditional shooter, with the gimmick being that Ethan has come down with a bad case of alcoholism and needs a drink to steady his hand. Word to the wise, don't do what I did and assume this is a secret moral choice thing where you get a bad ending if you drink too much during the campaign, because that's not the case. Like in real life, there's no negative consequences for drinking, so just do it whenever you want. Believe me, Condemned 2's ending will be bad enough regardless. The final and most welcome gameplay change is the revamping of the detective elements. When you stumble on a crime scene, instead of just scanning the evidence and moving on, you have to complete a multiple choice quiz to determine what happened. Some are ridiculously easy, others are downright dirty and designed to trip you up. Your performance in these quizzes doesn't change the plot or the challenges you face if you get stuff wrong, but the more right answers you get, the better your upgrades will be throughout the game. On paper, this is kind of genius, right? Well, yeah, but Monolith made a baffling choice in how the upgrades are handed out. You probably thought it was something like, each right answer gets me a point, I get X number of points, I get a new upgrade. Sort of like unlocking new abilities in Dead Rising the more survivors you rescue, right? Wrong. Instead, at the end of each level, you get an upgrade regardless. Get all the answers right and find all the collectibles, and the upgrade is much stronger. If you get a quiz wrong or miss a well-hidden side objective, there's no way to get that chapter's best upgrade again, period, short of reloading a checkpoint. The gulf in quality with some of these upgrades is completely insane. Get every question wrong in Chapter 3, and you get a taser with two shots per battery that momentarily stuns enemies. Get every question right, and you get five shots per battery, and it completely incapacitates them. When you learn what you're missing out on, it's very tempting to use a guide, which obviously ruins the whole fun of the detective thing. Stay away from guides, don't get too greedy. This game is not that hard. Granted, Condemned 1 wasn't hard either, but it was still tense. What kills the tension so much in Condemned 2? The health bar. Condemned 1 had a simple system. You take damage when you get hit, you need a health pack to fill it back up. Condemned 2 used a three-segment health bar. After a few seconds, the segment you are currently on restores, but nothing above it. This ruins everything. Let me explain. While exploring the frightening corridors of Condemned 1, you were always worried that an enemy might pop out. Even with a taser and a gun, you were still on edge, because every hit you took counted. You weren't getting that back unless you found a health pack, and god forbid you get your health chunked right before a checkpoint. By contrast, I quickly found myself mad dashing through the levels of Condemned 2 with little care. If an enemy gets the drop on me and lands a cheeky hit, it'll just recover a moment later. If an enemy completely wastes me, I just pop back at the last checkpoint with all my health restored. Oh, yeah, I forgot to mention. Dying sends you back all of 30 seconds due to how frequent checkpoints occur, and it gives you a full health restore. I genuinely feel relieved to die sometimes, because it means I can just do the next room again with triple the health. And that's it for the combat. I'm sure you don't need me to go into why a crane minigame and a turret section back-to-back -back are tedious. You all already know that. Let's get to the main event, the Looney Tunes plot. Imagine if all of man's atrocities, war, murder, acts of cruelty, the very origins of crime itself can be explained and linked to this group. Ethan has retired from the SCU and is now a homeless drunk. The murder of Malcolm Van Horn gets the SCU interested in Ethan once again, and they task him with assisting investigating the mayor's murder. Her cap was detated from her head, and strange metal implants were removed from her body. Doubting this was a BDSM sort of what would she do for a PS5 thing, Ethan follows a unique forensic clue to an abandoned lodge. Up north, Ethan's plane is downed, he's attacked by a rabid bear, and then an SCU strike team shows up to kill him and blow up the cabin. Ethan narrowly prevents the blast by tossing the bombs at the window. Ethan finds a recording of the late Malcolm Van Horn explaining that Ethan's parents were part of an ancient cult called the Oro. Ethan was like the Harry Potter of this universe, and his parents died to protect him because he was born with some sort of tremendous power. With me so far? Ethan finds SKX, who has been offing Oro members to try and gain their powers. They track former Oro member the Magic Man to his magic theater, and Ethan finally wins his battle with alcoholism. And I mean literally, you physically fight the embodiment of alcoholism in a bar. Ethan learns that the Oro are creating paranoia and violence using sonic waves emitted from their metal-enhanced bodies and are the source of all of humanity's criminality and evil. They're afraid of Ethan's power because his natural sonic forces are so strong that he can yell at people so hard they explode. Ethan sabotages the Oro's master control device, then confronts the inside man at the SCU. He shows Ethan his awesome gaming setup, then Ethan kicks him off a ladder to his death after learning the span is just a pawn. And in the game's end tag, the Euro's true mastermind is revealed. It's the president. <laughs> uh, for context of how hard and fast these plot elements hit you, this is all crammed into the second half of the game. You don't even get to the mayor's headless body until chapter 6. The first five chapters consist of two dream sequences and three back-to-back -back chapters where you have to flee a crime scene in the middle of a riot. And while it's true that arc does end on a colorful level where you fight a crazy candy woman by throwing robot grenade dolls at her in a burning toy factory, that entire sequence has nothing to do with the plot. This game does have good atmosphere, but between the zany story and the stress-free combat, it's asking the atmosphere to carry everything, which unfortunately it just couldn't for me. Now, maybe I haven't turned you off on Condemned 2. Maybe you're thinking, this plot sounds so bad it's good. I love that kind of thing. Well, there's one thing holding the ridiculousness back from being as entertaining as it should be, and it's Ethan Thomas. Ethan got the opposite treatment from Cole McGrath in the Infamous series. He started out by being voiced by Matt from Heroes, or I guess for the younger people out there, uh, this guy from Star Wars? 
I, I, I saw all the movies, I still don't know who this is. Condemned 2 has pretty much replaced every voice and every character model from the first game, which just adds to the disconnect between the two. Do you recognize the voice? No, I don't. So now Ethan is a grizzled drunk hobo who shouts at everyone, even his friends. I've noticed a pattern in So Bad It's Good Games, and it's the protagonist. They tend to be this sort of gormless, lovable autist with a sociopathic streak. Think Detective Halligan or Max. Jesus, I shot myself! Ugh, I shot myself! Back up, back Stupid up! gun! But Ethan's portrayal is too mean-spirited and spoils the fun. Guy really needs to work on his positive attitude. Maybe this is just a me thing, the uber self-serious protagonist might be a trope that leaves you in stitches. Before I conclude, yes, yes, I am aware that they mentioned Ethan having weird bone and vocal cord structure in the first game, and there were nods to the cult, so before anybody gives me the, um, actually, I am aware, but it was kept in the background enough to not suck me out of the main storyline's atmosphere. And to be frank, I always thought the bone structure and special gifts lines were to justify why Ethan can take a beating and why we get flashbacks to what the serial killers were up to. It always struck me as unnecessary. I know this is a video game, there doesn't have to be logic to everything. Quick flashbacks help tell the story. Come to think of it, a needless story explanation for a gameplay mechanic that could easily be written off as reflexes and intuition also plagued Fear, which Monolith released around the same time as Condemned. But I'm gonna wrap this review up. Now is not the time for fear. That comes later. Mr. Boobs, Mr. Boobs, Mr. B-double-O-Z, don't ever choose, cause you wanna